Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Well, no deal. Once again, the city of Surrey says it's sticking with the RCMP, turning down provincial funding to move to a local police force. Now this story, it's about public safety, politics and entrenched positions, and it's gone on for six years. So as a member of the public, what's your advice to the mayor of Surrey and the public safety minister? In half an hour, the rise of online gambling. What do you think of its popularity and when does it become a problem? I'm Michelle Elliott. Welcome to BC Today. Thank you for joining us on CBC Radio 1, CBC Television, and live streaming on the CBC News app, cbc.ca slash bc, and on YouTube on the CBC Vancouver page. And you can call us right now on our top story. What do you think of the latest decision from Surrey's mayor, Brenda Locke, on the Surrey police transition? And what's your advice to the Surrey mayor and to the public safety minister? You can call us 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. By email, you can reach us at bctoday at cbc.ca or send us a text at 236-330-2623. Now, the deal would have provided the city of Surrey $150 million for the transition to the Surrey Police Service and up to $20 million per year for five years. And that's to offset the salary differences for officers. Surrey Mayor Brenda Locke says her decision to turn down that offer and stick with the RCMP is, quote, in the best interest of the taxpayer. Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth calls it disappointing and that the people in Surrey just want to, quote, get on with it. Well, what about you? What do you think of this latest decision from Surrey City Council and its mayor? And what is your advice for the mayor of Surrey and the public safety minister? You can call us 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733, and pound 690 on your cell phone by email bctoday at cbc.ca. Now, we requested an interview with Mayor Brenda Locke uh, in Surrey, but uh, she was not available to join us. Uh, this morning on CBC's The Early Edition, Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth spoke to Stephen Quinn, and he said he's disappointed by Mayor Locke's decision. The mayor and, uh, and the council, um, the city of Surrey, uh, approached us um, back in January saying that they wanted to uh, sit down and negotiate a settlement. And at the time, we were surprised because of the position of this, the city had been, you know, sort of rock solid, which was no, no, no. And so we were, uh, oh, optimistic that, uh, oh, let's, you know, we'll sit down, do the responsible thing, because people of Surrey know a decision's been made. They want it uh, to, you know, just get on with it. And we uh, negotiated in good faith and uh, believed that uh, we had an agreement, and they rejected it. Well, joining me now is Hamish Telford, political scientist at the University of the Fraser Valley. Hi, Hamish. Welcome back to the show. Good afternoon, Michelle. Uh, should we be surprised? Well, yes and no. <laughs> I guess the way this story has gone, uh, we should not be surprised. But with a quarter of a billion dollars on the table to help this transition, yes, I am a little surprised that Surrey... Uh, did not finally accept the province's offer to get on with this transition. So um, clearly there's more to the story mm. um, that we don't know. Um, the two sides not even agreeing on who just, who called for what meeting. <laughs> um, and and how where this goes from here is I, I, I'm mystified. Yeah, mystified is a good word. And not agreeing as well on what the cost will be because um, what, uh, what the Mayor Brenda Locke said, here's our budget, and this shows that it's going to cost half a billion dollars more over 10 years to transition to the Surrey Police Service. Mike Farnworth this morning said, you know, our offer was based on numbers from Surrey, so disagreement there too. Exactly. Um, and as one politician famously said, uh, in politics, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I, I think we're getting down to the, the statistics part of it and how much this is going to cost. And, you know, budget projections 10 years out um, are not hugely reliable. The further out you go, uh, the more disagreement there will be on numbers. And, mm. um, and, and cities have control over police budgets to a certain extent. Um, and, and how much are you going to tax and so forth. 
So the longer these projections go out, the more unreliable they become. But the province has certainly put up a lot of money to help the transition over five years. Um, and it's a lot of money that they have put on the table. Okay. Hamish Shelford is with me, a political scientist at the University of the Fraser Valley, mystified by the latest decision from Surrey Mayor Brenda Locke to turn down this offer of funding for the transition to the Surrey Police Service. Uh, Brenda Locke saying this is uh, what's best, what's in the best interest of Surrey taxpayers. We're asking you, what is your advice to the mayor, to Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth? Um, love to hear from you throughout the half hour here. 1-800-825-5950, 604 you can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. Jeremy is calling us from Vancouver. Hi, Jeremy. Good morning. What do you think should happen? I think, and it's long overdue, they need a very simple referendum. Uh, it should simply say, you're, as a resident of Surrey, do you want A, the RCMP, or B, the Surrey Police Force? No other complications to that wording. Um, I think that while referendums are expensive, mm -hmm. uh, given the burn rate of cash in this decision to date, uh, I, I think it would be trivial. Uh, I think that it should be 50% plus one, and it should be binding on the politicians on both ends. And my suspicion, but I don't know this, is that I'm sure both sides have thought of this, but the embarrassment of losing is too much for them to suggest this. But I think at the end of the day, the citizens of Surrey should make this decision. I don't think the province should make it. I don't think the mayor of Surrey at this point has got enough clout behind her to make it on her own. She didn't have a 50% plus one votes for her, even though she could argue people voted that way. She has argued that this is what the public voted for, right? Yes, yes, sure. But it wasn't a two-person race. And, and uh, you know, I mean, if it had been a referendum question, uh, I and, and it... You know, it was, I don't know, 60 percent. I, I don't think there would be any I don't think the province would have gone down that road if it had been 60 percent in favor of keeping the RCMP. And she wouldn't have been able to go down this road if it was 60 percent in favor of switching to the SPS. I, I, I honestly believe that this is nonsense and a waste of time and taxpayers money, both at the provincial and the municipal level. I live on the North Shore. That's not our problem now. Our problem is a, a giant white ele elephant down on the waterfront, and that's a whole other discussion. I, another issue there. We may cover it and, and have you call back on that too, Jeremy. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Take care. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, Brenda Locke uh, winning in 2022 with 28.14 percent, and uh, Doug McCallum behind at 27.31 percent. So that was the the result of the municipal election in Surrey in 2022. Uh, Jeremy, um, pardon me, that was Jeremy in Vancouver. And up next, uh, we have Denise from Surrey. Hi, Denise. What are your thoughts on this decision by your mayor? Hi. Good afternoon. Um, my thought is that um, it's, it's incredibly disappointing, and I think we should move on with it. I think that there, um, as your other guests spoke, there's probably a backstory to this for not accepting that amount of money. It's a, a, a large amount of money, and I thought that that's what we were asking for to um, move forward. Um, as a longtime resident of Surrey, um, I just, I, it's just very, it's been going on for so long. Yeah, how do you feel about just that? Disappointed, disappointed in Brenda Locke and um, and the the whole council. Um, as a 30 year resident of Surrey, um, it's just disappointing. And um, I just, I don't think she's going to get in in the next election if she chose, chooses to run again. But it's, 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 it's been, I think, um, uh, you know, both sides have been um, looking at this for just so long that it's it's time to move on and make the change. And um, as your previous caller uh, from the North Shore said, um, you know, um, whether we would have had a referendum on it or not, um, you know, um, let's you know, it's been investigated. Let's just go and, and put it in the police force. It, you know, I, I, it's very, um, I'm sure, very hard on both um, um, the Surrey police and the RCMP as individuals. Mm. Um, 
that is probably taking its toll. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we owe them the respect to make this decision, and the politicians do um, uh, need to move on with this. And, uh, and it's disappointing they didn't take it. Denise, uh, you know, we heard from uh, Councillor Linda Anna saying, you know, other issues <laughs> just be being eclipsed, to use the word of the week by this, um, by this ongoing saga over the Surrey policing services and what to do. Um, and, and so what to you are some of those issues that you would really like to see more attention to? Well, I think there's a, a lot more attention to be put into um, just the, the growth of Surrey in general, how it's grown in over 30 years. They're looking at, you know, from education to the community services that um, um, Surrey is desperately needing, needed um, um, in all areas um, from recreation centers, but mm. primarily um, with our schools, with our portables that the students now um, are um, having to um, uh, have their education in. There's, there's so many things that... Um, that could be addressed mm. and here we're, we're we've been over this so you know for so long it's just um i think uh most uh, uh most of people that live in surrey i think they would feel the same way denise great to hear from you in surrey thanks very much for the call have a great afternoon bye-bye -bye. Uh, that's Denise uh, joining us from Surrey. Love to hear from you. Um, what are your thoughts on the latest decision from Surrey Mayor Brenda Locke to say, again, we are sticking with the RCMP and turning down this offer of funding from the province uh, that uh, would uh, help with the uh, transition costs to a Surrey police service. My guest is Hamish Telford, a associate professor of political science at the University of the Fraser Valley. What about that question of, you know, people have brought up the a referendum, and that would be actually hearing from the public on this. What's the likelihood of that at this point? Uh, zero, I would guess. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, look, uh, democracy is, 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 you know, voters are, are fickle, right? We, uh, the people of Surrey voted for a mayor candidate uh, who wanted to bring in a new police force. That was his signature policy, and they voted for that. Then they voted for, for a mayoralty candidate who wanted to reverse it. Right. Um, and, and so at this point, would people vote for or against? I don't know. Uh, I suspect, as, as Denise was saying, most people in Surrey just want to get on with it. Uh, and given the amount that's been invested in the new force, pro probably carry on in that direction. Mm. But I, I think the bigger issue here is that the provincial government is making its decisions on Surrey um, in a, uh, from a provincial context. Mm. And in the provincial context, uh, we've got policing shortages across the province, acute shortages with the RCMP across the province. If that wasn't an, an issue for the provincial government and the Solicitor General, then perhaps they would be more willing to work with Surrey in, in keeping the RCMP there. Uh, but given the policing demands around the province, um, the provincial government has made the decision that this transition has to go forward. So it's not simply a question of what uh, policing is going to happen in Surrey. Right. This from the provincial government, they're looking at this at the, from the perspective of the entire province. So can you see then, and, and can, can we see the, the uh, perspective of Mayor Brenda Locke here? What she's talked about is, you know, the province sort of imposing uh, mm -hmm. its decisions on, on a municipal government. Is it overstepping? No, I don't think so. Uh, given that, you know, the previous mayor and council came to the province saying we wanted to go forward with the transition, mm. the province approved that. Mm. Uh, and, and you know, that was put into motion. And, and at a certain point, there is a there is a point of no return with these things. Uh, I always thought it would be difficult, if not impossible, for, for Brenda Locke to reverse the decision at the point that they were at. And, 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 and here we are now. Problem, Yes, um, and and that was certainly the position that the province came to, uh, as well. And and you know, the province can't afford for city councils to to flip flop on issues of this significance with every election. Um, and they've amended the police act to ensure that that doesn't happen uh, in in the future. Okay. Um, and so I, I think the province, yes, they're putting their foot down. I understand how the the mayor feels overruled. She has been overruled by a higher power. And, and that no one likes being overruled by higher powers. 
Um, but but the province is the higher power here and okay. does have the authority to make these decisions. I want to ask you um, before we end this what uh, what your advice would be as well because we're asking this of our callers. But right now William is uh, joining us from Port Hardy. Hi William, and it sounds like you lived and worked in Surrey at one point. Yes, I I started teaching at Lena Shaw in 1960. I taught high school at junior high in Cloverdale. I taught 10 years at Princess Margaret Senior okay. Secondary. Mm -hmm. So you have a history and there. And we did just fine with the RCMP. Mm. I'm an old guy now. I'm in 94th year. <laughs> and I, I just want to ex express my opinion. And I, I would say this. We have done fine with the RCMP. And surely the RCMP is a nationwide uh, uh, police force. They are in a much better position. To, to police Surrey, then starting a new a new police force for Surrey. That's just my opinion, mm. uh, and uh, whatever for whatever it's worth, I, I just thought I I express my opinion. Okay. I appreciate it very much, William. Thanks thanks for the call. All right. I'll take care. And Jeff is calling us uh, in South Surrey. Hello, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? I don't think we have Jeff on the line, but we have another caller from South Surrey, and Daniel is joining us now. Hi, Daniel. Hi. I suggest uh, uh, that to keep the RCMP instead of wasting more money, and that 330 police are already hired Surrey, let them join the RCMP, put them merge together, then we're going to have more police. Instead of wearing Surrey police uniform, they, they can wear uh, RCMP. Okay. And this way we save money. We don't waste money, and uh, they're already trained, and then they can hire more. My son applies three times to RCMP because mm. I encourage him to go to RCMP, and RCMP always make excuses. And guess what? Now he's in the Navy. He's more happy than uh, the says. I forgot they didn't hire me. So okay. RCMP also, they're not hiring. So what your advice, uh, you know, they, okay, and your advice then to your mayor would be to stick with it, to um, uh, uh, keep the fight? And put all these 330 police that are already getting paid, all the stuff, join with RCMP. One force, okay. uh, one order, and they are going to be more uh, people safe, uh, safe uh, in the city. Daniel, thank you very much for the call. Uh, and congratulations to your son, who's got a job with the Navy. Um, and uh, let's go back to Hamish Telford now. Uh, what would you expect from, from politicians um, at this juncture of this um, ongoing debate? Well, that really depends on what's driving them. Um, if this is about money and financing the new police force, then I would have expected by this point um, that they would have reached a deal. Uh, and it seemed like they had reached a deal. The minister thought they had reached a deal. Um, and for whatever reason, um, reasons that are not clear yet, uh, Surrey has, has uh, never agreed to it or has, has got cold feet and decided to reject uh, the agreement. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that the province will want to spend more on this, particularly after they went through this latest round of bargaining with Surrey on this matter. A few months ago, they were saying 150 million was going to be the limit. Now mm. they're saying up to 250. So, um, so if it's just about the financing of it, it should be possible to reach an agreement. But if there's something else driving the the, the, the mayor or the council, hmm. uh, it may not be possible to reach an agreement. What's your advice then? If you could my have their ear. Would, <laughs> my advice would be to recognize that the province is the higher power here. They do have the authority to make policing decisions for the province, including municipalities. So drive for the hard, high, the best bargain you can get um, and settle the issue and, and move forward uh, with it. Um, and, and I think we had reason to believe that that moment was upon us, um, but it fell through. So we're just going to have to wait and see how things pan out in, in the coming days and weeks. Oh, yes, so we will. And we'll, I'm sure, chat again. Thanks so much for your time. You're welcome, Michelle. Ha Hamish Telford is political scientist at the University of the Fraser Valley. Thanks so much for all of your calls. 1225 now, 125 in the Mountain Time Zone here with BC Today. And lots more on the day's top stories throughout the afternoon in your region. And in Victoria, here's what's coming up on All Points West.
Hey, Michelle, Jason D'Souza here in Victoria. Coming up this afternoon on All Points West, you might know that Victoria is no stranger at all to bike lanes. A number of proposals continue to be in place, but one of them is particularly interesting. It would change the entire entrance into the downtown core. We're going to talk about the idea of bike lanes on Blanchard. We're going to head downtown to have a walk and talk with a Victoria City Councillor who wants to see that become a reality. And also coming up on the program, we'll tell you about a new dance performance that's set to premiere right here on Vancouver Island. It explores living with chronic pain and dance. Those stories and so much more coming your way this afternoon here on All Points West. Thank you very much, Jason. You can hear All Points West this afternoon at uh, on CBC Radio 1 in Victoria. And of course, you can use the CBC Listen app as well. A lot more thoughts on our email on our top story question. What would be your advice to Surrey Mayor Brenda Locke and Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth? Elizabeth writes, I think this will be a case study for years to come on the importance of municipal politics and public engagement. Although the current mayor states repeatedly that she was elected to ensure the RCMP remained in Surrey, that may not be an accurate reflection of the population in Surrey. The almost 70 percent of people who did not bother to go out to vote are likely reeling and angry about how this has escalated into such a debacle. I do believe the mayor's identity is so wrapped up in this that she's finding it impossible to move on for her stance. This is not what is in the best interest of her community by any stretch. Thank you for that. BC Today at CBC.ca. A lot more thoughts on the latest decision in Surrey on the uh, d debate over the transition to the Surrey Police Service. Carrie calls us now from Surrey. Hello. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Yes. Um, I'm so glad you're having this segment. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a subject I'm quite passionate about. Mm. Um, and first and foremost, uh, Brenda Locke has my absolute support. Um, if I may um, correct your guest a little bit, um, having been a longtime Surrey resident, um, when Doug McCallum was voted in, there was very little mention of a police department. The reason he was voted in is because we were unhappy with Linda Hepner, and specifically to do with the LRT. So when he started working, um, pushing the whole notion of a Surrey to police department, mm -hmm. it was really done under a shroud of secrecy. There was very little information. Um, I read an old article recently where he said it was going to cost the city of Surrey uh, approximately an extra two to three million dollars. So I, I am confident and I feel like just from t talking to neighbors, Brenda Locke was our referendum. Um, if you look at the caliber of candidates that were there at the time, you had Ginny Sims, you had Gordy Hogue, you had Suk Dollywall. She was relatively unknown compared to all of them. She beat them all for the sole reason she was the only one that said that she was going to keep the RCMP. Mm. The day after she was elected, she said she was going to put a freeze on all hiring. The Surrey police chief went ahead and um, continued anyhow. And it wasn't until for another at least six to seven months after that when Farnsworth said, no, we're going to continue with the transition. So there was time to pause. There was time to put the brakes on this, perhaps reverse it. And one thing I'll add, I think, which is very infuriating for myself and I believe others in my neighborhood, we have yet to be given a, a reason, a tangible reason, why this is even necessary. There's no proof this will make us safer. Um, all the excuses about poaching from other jurisdictions, well, mm -hmm. that's happening now that they are, now that Surrey police are the most expensive municipal police force in Canada because of the Me Too clause with Vancouver. And I'm terrified, even with the promise of the 250 million from the province, what happens after those five years? are up like what what are my property taxes going to look like then and again we're spending a lot of money just for what per seems to be an officer switching from one uniform to another with zero reasons why it needs to happen okay carrie really good to hear from you as well uh thanks very much glad we got you in thank you that's Car carrie in surrey 
Uh, thank you for all of your calls on that. Much more on this issue and this story, of course, throughout the day here on CBC. It is 12.30 now, 1.30 in the Mountain Time Zone, and it's time for a CBC News update with Robert Zimmerman. <clears throat> Good afternoon. There is growing concern about BC's uh, snowpack. It is now considered extremely low, averaging just 63% of normal. It was 88% at this time last year. The province says this is the lowest snowpack since 1970 for the province and the Fraser River. A man is dead after he was stabbed last night in Victoria. He was found outside a strip mall on Douglas Street. Police believe it's an isolated incident, but didn't release any details about a possible motive or arrests. And we have a correction to a story we aired yesterday. We reported two credit rating agencies, SMP and Moody's, had downgraded BC's credit rating from AA to AA minus. SMP did downgrade the rating to AA minus. However, Moody's maintained its AAA rating for the province, but revised its outlook to negative. And now the forecast on the north coast. Periods of rain this afternoon with strong winds and a high of 8. Highs to 9 degrees with increasing cloudiness in the peace. In the central interior, including Prince George, mainly cloudy with a high of 10. Highs up to 14 with lots of sunshine in the Kootenays. In the southern interior, including Kelowna, mainly sunny with a high of 15. And a mix of sun and cloud this afternoon in Greater Victoria. Increasing cloudiness in Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley with highs around 13. That's your CBC News update from Vancouver. And, uh, well, sort of breaking this morning, the PE, the PE Fair announced its lineup right. for 2024 you summer night concerts. You did. I took a look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I noticed there, it looks like they're sort of targeting the oldies like me, right? And me, uh, yeah. I, is this maybe because they had a riot at Little Baby a couple of years ago? <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah. I don't know what that's Shifted, about. Although, you know. So. Um, yeah, I mean, let's, okay, Burton Cummings, Blondie, come on, Blondie, that, mm -hmm. that spans generations, I would say. The Commodores, the Pointer Sisters, I'm so excited. Yeah. Uh, Blue Rodeo. I'm less excited. But Are you okay. less excited? <laughs> yeah. You tell me, you tell me, you jump in and tell me. Uh, um, well, would I go, I don't think I would, well, no? sure, I sure, probably not. not. I no, mean, probably not. Okay, fine. Ludicrous. I love the 90s tour. I'm all over the I love the 90s tour. That's what I have to say. Mm. I did go see TLC at the PE with uh, Shaggy. And that a was a couple good. years ago. That was fun. I danced all night. Mm. Danced my head off. All right. Uh, yeah. So I am all over this. I will be there. <laughs> I'm excited and I will behave. I promise. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I am the target audience. <laughs> like That's you. right. I'm, I think I'm a little older than you, You're Michelle. I think it's actually Burton Cummings and Blondie. Mm, I don't know if that's your demographic quite. Okay, not so much, but whatever. I'll enjoy it. Sure. Okay, fine. You you go, and I'll go to the other one. All right. All right. Rob, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Rob Zimmerman in the CBC Vancouver Newsroom. And yeah, that uh, announcement this morning, uh, August 17th to September 2nd at the Pacific Coliseum Summer Night Concerts at the PNE. You're with BC Today. This is BC Today here on CBC. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Michelle Elliott. And in our last half hour, hour we were discussing uh, the latest uh, chapter in this ongoing saga in Surrey over uh, the transition to the Surrey Police Service. We have another call, in fact, and Daniel is calling us from uh, very close by in Delta. Hi, Daniel. Hi, how are you? I am just fine. And what are your thoughts? What would be your advice to the players in this? Well, you, you know, when you look at the landscape in British Columbia, especially in the lower mainland, it seems to me there are too many police forces, period. It reminds me of the, uh, of the, the, the fire system as well, the fire responders. There's many different fire halls. And, and then when I look at BC Ambulance, for instance, it's a consolidated force across the whole province. Mm. Uh, so also you look at uh, TransLink, it's a consolidated trans, uh, transit delivery system for 23 municipalities who look at BC Transit. So this, this question of having, you know, five, six, seven, eight police chiefs and the overburden of administration for every police force, 
and the funding model and the funding that gets distributed amongst all those police forces, it, it seems to me the province should be looking at a, a, with the municipalities at a more consolidated approach. Hmm. Uh, a, a provincial police force, the RCMP, what have you, but uh, this, this, what's going on now in Surrey, if, if it's true there was a referendum and they elected the mayor with that, with that mandate, it seems that the, the citizens of Surrey should be trying to pay for this, not the province. Um, so I would support the province's position, but more globally, they should be looking at the, 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 the redundancy within the system, if you ask me. Okay. Daniel, great to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. That's Daniel in Delta. 12.36 now, 1.36 in the Mountain Time Zone. And you can call us as well uh, in a few minutes on our second topic as we talk about the rise of online gambling. But first, Ramadan has officially come to an end, and Muslims across the world are marking the occasion with Il al-Fatir. And here in Vancouver, there was a large gathering this morning at BC Place, and CBC's Michelle Morton was there and spoke to people arriving for prayers and celebrations. Today is about Eid, so the celebration. So we fasted for about 30 days, so it's a blessing month. So finally, after 30 days, we will have a Eid. So celebration and, you know, praying in the morning and get together with the family, have a good time and bless the world, you know. Oh, me to me, we have a lot of plans. So we have a busy place. We came with the family and kids. So you have some good time, pray in the morning. And after that, we have a lunch, we have a dinner plan. And Friday also, we have a plan together, like a, our community dinner as well. So there's a lot going on this week. It's just not, not just not one day. So we're going to celebrate a week. And my family from back home. So I called them uh, yesterday as well. So they got the Eid yesterday. So yeah, it's a lot of fun and, uh, and hope for the world for a better future, you know, peace and, and uh, peace and prosperity. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's the Eid festival, end of Ramadan, and we are here to celebrate. There are probably about 10,000 people in there, and we are coming all the way from Hope to uh, visit this event. It's the end of Ramadan celebration, yes. Uh, hanging out with family and food, lots of food and coffee. Yeah. Yes, I know. Uh, today is all about like family and celebration. Uh, we celebrate the end of Ramadan uh, with family and friends, and uh, it's a day to be grateful for everything. And Eid Mubarak to those of you celebrating. Well, a month ago, Ontario became the first province in Canada to ban the use of athletes and celebrities in online gambling ads. And this was over concerns that the ads were fueling gambling addictions. And so far, calls for the federal government to follow suit in banning these ads have not resulted in any change. But pressure from groups like Ban Ads for Gambling continues. Here in BC, gambling generated $1.6 billion in net income in 2022 and 23, and this income goes back into provincial coffers, supporting programs like community gaming grants for sports, arts, and culture organizations, also supporting gambling addiction recovery programs. But we're asking how much is gambling and online gambling a problem in BC? And we're asking you this half hour, what are your thoughts on the rising popularity of online gambling? And when do you think it becomes a problem? You can call us 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone by email. It's bctoday at cbc.ca. And I have two guests with me for this discussion. Adrian Cossum is a registered clinical social worker with Gambling Support BC, also the host of the podcast Foldem. And Bryce Taylor is a recovering gambling addict. Hello to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for having me and talking about this important issue. Thank you for having me as well. It is an important issue for sure. Thanks so much to, to both of you for joining me. Adrian, can we get the big picture from you um, to start off? You know, how, how big a problem is gambling addiction in BC? Do we know? Yeah, we, I think we absolutely do know. So that um, uh, we certainly know lots of people gamble and um, roughly about 3.3% of the population would it be at risk, sort of low, medium, high risk of experiencing gambling problems. And, and I think the bigger thing is, is like a lot of people 
wouldn't identify themselves as having a gambling problem or a disorder, but we certainly know that it's causing harms for people. Um, but the tricky thing is that it's a hard topic for people to talk about. Mm. So there's absolutely people in our communities um, experiencing some difficulties because of gambling, whether that's affecting their mental health, their finances, their relationship, but it's not talked about. There's a big stigma with this issue. Yeah. And, and, you know, in light of that, Bryce, I'm really thankful to you for coming on and, and talking about your experience. Um, can you tell me when you knew that this was becoming a problem for you? Um, I knew it was becoming a problem about the time that I was ready to get married and I was starting to hide my finances from my fiance mm -hmm. and, and I was making up excuses and reasons as to why the money that I was making wasn't matching the money that I had. Mm. What was it like for you to come to that realization? It was tough because at that point, the addiction had taken over. So even though I had come to terms with it and knew that it was a problem, the addiction was still running the show. Mm. So it was constantly trying to make up excuses, even though it, it's kind of like you have the two, uh, two voices on your shoulder. And unfortunately, the gambling voice was a lot stronger. Oh. What impact did it have on your life? Um, it had a great impact on my life, uh, constantly being stressed, um, um, always trying to, it's like a deck of, uh, a house of cards, trying to remember what lie I told this person or what lie I told that person. And does the first person know the second, the lie that I told the second person and just the stress it put on my marriage and my family, both, uh, both my wife's family, as well as my family. And for a while there, it was very, very bad and to the point where I was not living at home because the addiction had gotten so bad. And what eventually helped? Um, I finally hit rock bottom. Um, unfortunately, I had become very depressed. I had become uh, very uh, suicidal. I did not want to to be around anymore. Um, and I, the police took me into custody and I was taken to the hospital where they said that I did not fit the criteria, criteria for someone who was, uh, who needed to be watched. So at that point, I just felt like I'd lost all hope. And, uh, my wife uh, had, uh, had decided to talk to me and say, listen, I have some, uh, family members who had gone through a treatment center and they're willing to take you. And I went there during COVID and it probably saved my life mm. because it allowed me to be in a place for four months without any electronic devices. And it allowed my brain to have a hard reset and, and create pathways and to actually deal with my addiction. What do you want to share your story and your experience? Um, I want to share my story because I feel like there's a lot of people out there like me who the stigma of because there's no physical like ailment you like when a person is drunk or a person is is on something you can see that that there's something wrong with them but unfortunately with gambling addiction it's all in your mind so there is no physical signs to show that there is a problem. And I think that is is one of the biggest issues is people kind of get this uh, look about, about them that, you know what, how can this person have a problem when there's no signs? Mm. And I feel like if I'm able to tell my story and show that it can happen to anyone, then maybe people will start to to talk about it and I also feel like we need to have more residential treatment centers for just gambling. Because at this time, I believe there are no residential treatment centers in BC for just gambling. Well, what a, what a journey you've been on, Bryce, and what you've been through. I really appreciate your sharing your story. Thank you. Um, why don't thank we... Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, Adrian, what goes through your mind hearing about Bryce's experience? 
Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I just, I'm so grateful that he's willing to speak up, as I said, because it's, it's a very difficult issue for people to talk about. Um, I hear about the significant impacts it did have on him and, um, and that he was able to get help. And so what I, what I really just hope as people are listening to this is if you're recognizing for yourself that gambling is creating some difficulties for you, and there's a whole spectrum of, of those difficulties, is have the, have the courage and the willingness to take that step and to just reach out in whatever way you can to talk about it as opposed to keeping it to yourself. Mm. Um, because it's certainly, I think what we know is when you keep it to yourself, it's probably going to be more of the same. And this problem can just kind of keep progressing for people. It's not a matter of like a, a personal flaw. It's not a matter of weakness. It's a pretty complicated issue that just takes over in people's lives. And it's so important that you're not alone with it. Absolutely. And in fact, I do want to give out the number for the gambling support toll-free helpline. It is multilingual and it's 24-7. That number is one 888 795 Six one 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 again one eight 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 seven nine five six one one one, and uh, we are taking your calls this half hour as well with my guests uh, Adrian Cossum, who's a registered clinical social worker working with Gambling Support BC and host of the podcast Foldem, and along with Bryce Taylor, who just told us about his story as a recovering gambling addict. Let's go to our callers now. And our numbers, again, are 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733, pound 690 on your cell phone. We're asking for your thoughts on the popularity of online gambling and when do you think online gambling becomes a problem? Tom is joining us from Vancouver. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the show. Oh, hi. Yeah, I... Gambling has always been viewed as a societal ill because it is, and it's always been discouraged. They, they legalized it because you could do it online. Now, I didn't have a problem with that, but advertising it is absurd, and it's wall-to-wall. -wall. It's not just advertising. When you watch a hockey game, I mean, they're having – it's built right into the broadcast, and they're having tutorials on how to gamble and what it all means, mm. and it's, it's incredibly – damaging it destroys families i know somebody who had to uh leave the husband that she loved because he was bankrupting them they were going to lose their house and this happens all the time and if it's all about the revenue well why don't they sell fentanyl as well i mean it's absolutely ludicrous i have heart palpitations when i'm watching i i have my finger on the mute button during hockey games because i i mean it literally it 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 gives me heart palpitations. It's so evil. Why does it give you such a strong reaction? Because it's evil. It's evil. It's mm. evil. It's like it, it, it's like almost deliberately. And you've um, seen the impact. Hurting. It's hurting people. It's hurting people, and they they make it sound like you're doing your your bit for society. You're not. You've seen the impact of it, Tom. Absolutely. It's it, it's 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 hideous. It, it, it's very very. Bad. Like I said, I, I don't have a problem with it being legal. I have a real problem with it being advertised. Okay, so that line there. Thank you so much for your call, Tom. Um, why don't I go to Adrian Cossum on that? Yeah, the, the rise in advertising, um, what role is that playing? Is it a problem? We see that in Ontario. They have uh, taken steps with regard to advertising and using celebrities and athletes. Um, but what role is, is advertising playing right now? Yeah, I, I think there's going to be a growing discussion around having the industry hold some responsibility around addressing the harms. Um, and Ontario has sort of kick-started this off. Mm -hmm. For me, you know, what I think about is I think about young people. Um, the risk uh, the risk of developing gambling problems increases the earlier you're exposed to it. And the risk increases sort of with more exposure. The more you gamble, the more the risk of there being problems and so I think about young people watching all the ads on the sports and especially if there's celebrities involved and it's just exposing them and therefore creating more risk. Um, and so I think then there's a, there's a big concern and there's a bit of a societal responsibility 
um, I think to think about the risks and the harms and to, to take responsibility for that. And to what extent, though, I mean, you said there was, um, I think you said uh, there was a certain percentage, was it 33% who would be at risk of addiction? Um, so in BC, mm -hmm. we know that about 3.3% of the population experienced moderate to high risks of gambling problems. Okay. And so... Uh, I guess, where's the line between someone who is able to participate in online gambling and not become addicted, not have a problem um, versus when it does become an, an, uh, you know, something that has an impact? Um, some, some might say this, is, you know, I, I, I participate myself, I play, but it doesn't have an impact on me. It's simply recreational. Yeah, and, and so sorry, do you mean sort of how would people recognize that for themselves? Um, I guess, yeah. How do you bridge that gap or how do you balance um, the need to uh, recognize when it is a problem and be, be, have supports available um, and also the, the availability of it or the, um, you know, this, the, the freedom for people to be able to participate in something that, that is legal? Mm hmm and I guess I would say it, it can be similar to comparing it to alcohol use uh, in our society or drug use um, in that we, you know, we are very well aware that it's something that lots of people can choose to engage in. And I, I think that there's more information out there around the risks when it can come to some substances. Mm. Um, there's also perhaps more regulations around the advertising and the, the industry around that. Um, and perhaps there's more awareness around the help that's available. Mm -hmm. So um, I work for a program that's funded through the province called Gambling Support BC. Um, there's lots of support available. Um, and so I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm not so sure people out there do know about all mm. the support that is available to help them. And that that includes the, you know, all the spouses and family members and the children who are being impacted by this issue. Okay, and we, yes, as we heard from Bryce, you know, there's um, it, it just so happened that his family knew of this um, recovery center to go to. And Bryce, for yourself, what are your thoughts on on advertising? Like for you, um, what was the appeal for you? What drew you um, to online gambling in the first place? Well, for me, I started out as a recreational gambler. I'd play poker with my brother and his friends, and it kind of just slowly progresses from that. And what I don't like is kind of the whole motto of the BC Lottery Corporation of know your limit and play within it. Mm -hmm. To me, that is kind of misleading because unfortunately, as gambling addicts, we have no limit. So You're not able to recognize so it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we cannot recognize our limits and it's all for me it was never about the money it was always about chasing the rush of the anticipation of the next card mm. and and well i'm up now now i'm down now i'm up again and the high and and, and lows of that mm. and unfortunately it's just it's just like drugs it's you start at a certain level and after a while that kind of high off so now you have to increase it and it's the same with 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 unfortunately with gambling it's okay i was making a ten dollar bet and now that's not really doing it for me so now i want a bigger high and a bigger low mm. so now i'm making a hundred dollar bet or a two hundred dollar bet and and you don't really catch yourself until you look at your account and you realize okay i'm I'm this amount uh, overdrawn. I have three payday loans. I have two long-term payday loans. And it, it just kind of starts to, so then by that point, you're now having to bet even more just to try and win back the money to pay down the debts. Mm. We have an email from Dave who writes, gambling is the worst form of addiction because there is no visible sign. I know someone who blew half a million dollars and never could anyone tell there is a helpline nothing can be done if the gambler refuses because the person is an adult and again the helpline is 1-888-795-6111 adrian um what help is there and you host this podcast um and i've, I've looked at it uh, and it's it's interesting in terms of the stories that you tell but tell us about the, you know the help that is available Absolutely. So uh, the provincial government funds a program called Gambling Support BC, 
And I think our hope is just to reach people wherever they're at um, with being impacted with the harms of gambling. And so, you know, on the one hand, there's counseling services available, whether that's in person, video, phone, but a lot of people wouldn't say that they're ready to try counseling. So we also have outreach people there who can meet you on a more informal basis through a phone call, emails or texts and can connect you connected to supports. Hmm. We offer a range of groups. And what I'd say is during COVID, we, uh, the program created a podcast to reach the huge number of people who aren't ready to pick up that phone, but to share with them stories like Bruce has, Bryce has been doing today, to share a bit of skills and information from our colleagues um, so that there too, there's a way for you to connect. And so that that podcast is Foldem Help for Gambling Problems. We've been running for about three and a half years. Foldem Help for Gambling. I have just under a minute left, Bryce, but how, how are you doing now? How are you coping now? Uh, I'm doing really well. I'm three and a half years, coming up on four years since I went into the treatment center and I haven't placed a bet. And I think one of the things the government also really needs to focus on is, yes, getting help for the actual gambler is great, but also we need to provide more support for the affected others like my wife or my son mm -hmm. or the, the other people who are affected by this. Because unfortunately, like myself, I went to a treatment center. I was able to deal with all of my emotions and deal with all of my baggage. But I come home to my wife and my mm -hmm. son and they are still that far behind me yeah. and so the so they need uh, they need to focus more on providing mm -hmm. help for them whether it be counseling mm -hmm. or programs to help really bridge the gap because yeah. i could say to them all i want that you know what i'm yeah. i'm, I'm cured Bryce, I, i'm living yeah. with this and it's it doesn't the impact really on them. help them thank you so much mm -hmm. i really appreciate hearing from you thank you Thank all, you very all much. The, all the best, Bryce, and congratulations. The number again, again for the helpline.